Well, good evening, and uh, welcome to the midweek Bible class at Cannon Baptist Church. We welcome those of you who have joined us here in the room, and uh, those countless ones who have joined us online, and we pray that uh, the Lord will bless us and uh, open his word to us tonight, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we rejoice in you. You are the great God, the everlasting Father. And with you, there is no change, there is no variation. You're the giver of every good and perfect gift, and you have given us that priceless gift that we call faith. It is that apparatus that you have mysteriously placed in us and enables us to actually believe everything that you have told us in your word. We do not question your word. We accept it to be authoritative, inerrant, infallible, and without any mixture of error. And we thank you that you have given us a heart to study the word. The people in this room and the people who have joined us online are people who just have a hunger, not only to know your word, but to have an understanding. And there's a great difference. Very easy to know your word, much more difficult to understand your word. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of thought and a lot of prayer. And so tonight we commit ourselves to that. And we're just grateful for the privilege of being together and opening this blessed book, especially to the book of Revelation. We pray that you would teach us and instruct us tonight, and we'll give you all the praise and thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 That's, our, that's our prayer always. Take your Bible and turn with us to chapter 21. Uh, I, 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 I sort of hate this because we're getting close to the end of Revelation. And uh, I love the study of Revelation, as you can tell. And uh, uh, there are just so many wonderful things here for us to consider. And uh, tonight, I think, is going to be uh, perhaps a little more joyous uh, exploring of Revelation than some in the past. Uh, we're going to look at some of the beautiful things that God has prepared for us. And uh, I remember that I has not seen nor has ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man those things which the Lord has prepared for him. But we can't stop there. I've heard that quoted so often, and we just seem to stop there, and we draw a conclusion that you just can't understand it. Uh, there are things that just can't be understood. But listen to the next verse uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The next verse says, But the Lord has revealed them to us by his spirit. And so we're looking at his revealing. The book of Revelation, chapter 21, and we began last week with uh, that first verse where he says, Then I saw a new heaven and the new earth, because the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And we sought to understand that the uh, first heaven and the first earth have not disappeared, they have not just vanished. They have been changed. They have passed from one, uh, from one degree to another. During the, battle of, uh, uh, during the battle of Armageddon, at the conclusion of, uh, the, uh, uh, at the conclusion of the tribulation, before we got to the millennial reign, and I don't have time to go back to that, but uh, we, we've looked at this in the last few chapters. Uh, so, uh, the Battle of Armageddon is going to be centralized in the Middle East. Most of it will be in Israel. And it is going to be unbelievable carnage. Uh, this uh, massive army that Satan has uh, amassed, they're going to be slaughtered by the Lord, the sword of his mouth. And uh, they're going to lie dead on the plains. And you know how hot it is in the Middle East. And so it's not going to be but just a little while till it's going to be nothing but rotting, putrefying flesh. Uh, uh, we, we find the exaggerated statement, blood up to the horse's bridle, which uh, doesn't actually mean that the blood is going to be up to the horse's bridle, but it's what we call hyperbole. It's exaggerated speech to give us a picture of how, uh, how all of this is. So you can imagine the contamination that comes from that scene. And so we went back to uh, Ezekiel chapter 35, chapter 37, and we found that uh, people are going to go out. They're going to be sent out. They're called travelers. 
to gather up the bones. The Lord is going to call the vultures in to devour the flesh. And so, uh, of course, we know that the whole earth now, we're hearing about this all the time, about climate change because of uh, carbon dioxide and how we've uh, defiled the atmosphere of the planet, and that's the reason we're having all of these problems. Well, it is true that the atmosphere is filled with uh, all kinds of contamination. Uh, most of the doctors conclude that perhaps most of the illnesses that you and I experience come from one of two sources. One is in the air, and remember COVID and the mask, uh, and the other is water, because we almost literally do not have pure drinking water unless we add chemicals to it. So uh, all of this is going to be cleansed around the entire globe. That's what John is seeing here. He's seeing an earth that's been totally refurbished. It's like brand new. It's like it was in the very beginning of creation before man put his fingerprint on it. So he says the first earth and the first heaven, which would be the atmosphere, he said all of this has passed away. And in this place is a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. It's going to be very, very interesting. So we have the new heaven and the new earth, and then we have a new landscape. We find that in uh, the next verse of 21 when we see that there is no more sea, S-E-A, singular. This does not mean that there are no, no more oceans or large bodies of water on the planet. It just means a particular sea. The, the little article, T-H-E, is in the original text, the best we have, and so he said there was no more sea. The sea had been, uh, had, had, had been dried up and done away with. So our question was, what sea is it? There are three primary seas that are mentioned in the New Testament, and that is the Mediterranean Sea, which is always called the Great Sea, and then there is the Dead Sea. Everybody's familiar with the Dead Sea. Anybody that's gone on an uh, Israeli uh, trip you know, has gone to the Dead Sea. You don't go to Israel without going to the Dead Sea and floating in that briny water. Uh, and then the Sea of Galilee. Those are the three primary seas, although there are many other seas and uh, quite a few others that are mentioned in the, uh, in, in the New Testament. Uh, this brings us to the river, that there is a new river. And Ezekiel tells us that there is a river that flows from the throne. Uh, before we go to Ezekiel, just listen to Zechariah chapter 14, verse 8. Uh, he says, On that day, living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half to the eastern sea, that is the Dead Sea, and half to the western sea, that would be the Great Sea, the Mediterranean. And uh, it shall continue in summer as in winter. In other words, it's just a constant flow. The weather does not affect it at all, and it flows from the throne. And we see that in Revelation chapter 22, of the river of life that flows from the throne of Jesus. And that's what Zechariah is seeing. But he sees this, this new river, and that river is coming from underneath the threshold, under the throne uh, at the eastern gate. And it flows down to the Dead Sea. The interesting thing is, that that is the Jordan River. Right now, the Jordan River flows from Galilee, and I'm going over this again because I know we did it last week, but I want you to get it firmly fixed in your mind. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is the beginning of the Jordan River, as we know it in, in Bible times. And so the Jordan River flows down by Jerusalem down to the Dead Sea. It is the nastiest river, one of the nastiest rivers in the world, it's full of contaminants, and it empties in the Dead Sea, which has no outlet, and so that's the reason it is a Dead Sea. Nothing, absolutely nothing can live in the Dead Sea. But there is no more sea. That means the Sea of Galilee is done away with because it is no longer needed. The river is reoriented from the throne of Jesus Christ, fresh, living water, the total antithesis of the Jordan River. And as it flows down to the Dead Sea, it makes a tremendous difference. Listen to Ezekiel chapter 47, beginning in verse 8, just reading a few verses there. And the angel said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, 
and uh, enters the Dead Sea. Now, when the water flows into the Dead Sea, the water will become fresh, the water of the Dead Sea, because it's a fresh river now flowing into it. And verse uh, 10, uh, or verse 9, and there will be very many fish, verse 10, fishermen will stand beside the Dead Sea, its fish will be of every of very many kinds that uh, like the fish of the Mediterranean, the Great Sea. Verse 12, and on the banks of the river, get a picture of this, on the banks of the river, on both sides of the river, there will be grown, there, there, will, there will grow all kinds of trees. Their leaves will not wither nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month, beginning or uh, every month, because the water from the uh, water for them flows from the sanctuary. This is the new Jerusalem. Their fruit will be for food and leaves for health. Now we'll see when we get to chapter twenty. Two, that the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. I want you to notice here that you have months. The, 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 the tree on the either side of the river bears fruit 12 months in the year. That means we're still in time. I think we would all agree that the third heaven where God's throne is and where we will eventually be is timeless. There's no need for time there. And also, this tells us that during the millennial reign of Christ, there will be sickness on the earth. If there's no sickness, you certainly don't need any remedy. And the leaves of the tree are for what? For healing of the nations. Thirdly, we still have nations. And now we know that in the third heaven, where we're going to be uh, into infinitude without any end whatsoever, uh, we're all one. There are no nations there. There are no divisions there. All of this helps us to, to sort of understand the conditions of the, uh, of the millennial reign of Christ. So we want to look now at living under those conditions. What will life be like under these conditions in the new Jerusalem? Notice in uh, verse 2, he says, uh, And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a, as a bride, prepared like a bride. This, uh, uh, this city is not the bride of Christ. He is not going to be in some strange way uh, married to the land, except the concept of marriage is what? The welding of two together. The two shall become one. That's the significance of marriage. And so we talk about, a lot of cooks will talk about a certain spice being married to something. And they mean that they go together and they become as one. So we need to understand that the church is not the bride of Christ. The church is like a bride to Christ. So we are going to be one with Christ totally. Now right now we are to a certain degree. But... We're not one with Christ totally because we still have an old sin nature, right? That's where all your sin comes from. We know that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all our sin. The truth of the matter is you and I as believers sin. And thank God for 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. So we sin. As a matter of fact, Jesus told us that right up front. He said to his disciples, pray like this. He said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as is being done in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts, forgive our trespasses, or forgive our sin. And uh, any one of those words is, is often used in that. And Jesus said, listen to this, in that same discussion, 
If you don't forgive your brother or sister, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. So we need forgiveness. And thank God he has provided, provided that for us. So because we have this old sin nature, we're not totally one with Christ. At the moment we die, we leave the old sin nature behind and we are one, totally one with Christ. From that point on, we will never, ever sin again. Hallelujah. What a glorious thought. So, he has talked about the church like the bride of Christ. Now he sees the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared like a bride for her husband. What does that mean? The holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, is pristine. It, it, it's as perfect as perfect can be. And that's how a bride presents herself to her husband on the wedding day, right? She is, she's going to appear there at that altar looking the very best she can possibly look. And that's what John is conveying to us here. When he sees the New Jerusalem, he thinks of that imagery. This is magnificent. This is something very beautiful. And most of the, and of course this is earthly, but most of the grooms will tell you that when he sees that bride standing at the back door and the door's open and she's ready to come down the aisle, she's the most beautiful thing he's ever seen. And that's the, that's the imagery that John has for us. You understand that all of this is condescending language so we can get an idea of what things really are and what they're going to be like. Uh, Paul was caught up into the third heaven and he saw things, and we don't know what those things were because he said he could not even describe them. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, uh, I saw things, but they're beyond utterance. Uh, he, he couldn't describe them. But John gives us a description of the things that he sees. So look at uh, verse 2 of chapter 21. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, in this time, Jesus will be known as God. So there is a new recognition. There's a new acknowledgement. Everything is new here. Look at verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Now, people have traditionally read this and looked at the statement, and God himself will be with them, and they have concluded that this is not Jesus, this is God the Father. God himself. That is not tenable. It just cannot be true. Because all of this is heaven coming down to earth. We understand that, right? He sees the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven to earth and is placed on this new earth in this new cleansed heaven. Everything is pure, but it's from heaven to earth. If, if this reference here is of God the Father, that means God would leave his throne in the third heaven. And some of you haven't heard our studies say, well, where's the third heaven? Where do you get that? Well, you actually get it from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul said he was caught up into the third heaven. That tells us if there's a third heaven, mm -hmm. there is a first heaven and a second heaven. Otherwise, you could not have a third heaven. And we're not talking about the firmament. We're talking about the place. And so we understand that the third heaven to, where, to which Paul was caught up to is the dwelling place of God the Father. That's where God's throne is. Jesus left the earth at his ascension and went back to the third heaven where he is seated at the Father's right hand. The Father is not just floating somewhere in the firmament. The, the Father is in a place, and that is the third heaven. That's where Satan came from at the very beginning of our scripture. Uh, Satan and a third of the angels from the third heaven were banished to this earth. So that leaves us with understanding the first and the second heaven. The first heaven is now because we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And Fanny Crosby was right. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. 
of glory divine. So God dwells in us today through the Holy Spirit. That makes it heaven on earth. There's another aspect of this too, and it is that Jesus has always been present on this earth. Jesus created everything, and it's Jesus who created Adam and Eve out of the dust of the earth, and it's Jesus that walked with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day. That was not God the Father. It could not have been. He would have had to leave his throne in the third heaven and come to the earth. Imagine this. He leaves his throne in third heaven, and somebody walks into the throne room and says, where's God? And they say, we well, has gone for the day. He'll be back sometime tomorrow. This just doesn't happen. A God is always on his throne in the third heaven. One of these days, that will become much more clear to us. All right, so that's the first heaven, because Jesus' presence has always been here. He's the fourth man in the furnace. He's the one that walked with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He is the captain of the Lord's host before Joshua, and we can go on and on. These are called theophanies in the Old Testament. So Jesus is always present on the earth through the Holy Spirit. Now that leaves a question about the second heaven. Where is the second heaven? Right here. This is what we're looking at. That Revelation 21 is a picture of the second heaven. It literally is heaven on earth. It's not heaven in heaven. It's heaven on earth. And in that day, the blinders will be taken off. Today, you and I walk by faith. In that day, we will, when you leave your old sin nature behind at your death, you no longer need faith. When, 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 when you leave this world, you, you breathe your last breath and your heart beats the last time, you leave behind an old sin nature and you leave your faith behind. You do not take your faith with you. Because at that moment, everything you've embraced by faith is real. From that moment on, you're looking at facts. You need no proof, no verification. Now, you and I today, by faith, believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. We've celebrated that every single Christmas. That's what we believe. We believe that by faith. In that day, we will not believe that by faith. We will believe it by fact. So as you look at this, you're going to see that the dwelling place of God is the dwelling place of Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh. He will dwell with them, verse 3, he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself, that's Jesus Christ. It's an affirmation that our Lord, and we are God's gift, we are God the Father's gift to Jesus Christ, his son, we are given to him. John chapter 17, the Lord's Prayer. He tells us that very clearly. So Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Notice in verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. From whose eyes? Everyone? No. His people. That's us. Those who are redeemed, those who are born again. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. We will live for 1,000 years. We will not die. Now you need to be careful here. This is not a global condition. This is not happening on all of the planet. Remember, the planet is still going to be populated after the tribulation is over. Everybody is not killed. Now, we know that it's going to affect the entire population. To whatever degree, we don't know. But when Jesus Christ returns to earth, chapter 19, the earth is going to be well populated with unbelievers. So, you need to understand that the conditions we're looking at here are only occurring in the new Jerusalem. They're only occurring there. Notice this whole issue from chapter, from chapter 21 is I saw the new heaven and the new earth, and I saw the holy city coming down from heaven to earth. Now we're looking at the conditions only in the city. This cannot be applied to the entire planet. He will wipe away every tear from 
their eyes, the redeemed. And death shall be no more in the family of the redeemed. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Now look at the language here. No more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. For the former things have passed away. This means there's no need for medication for us. We will live in perfect health. Now, how is that going to be possible to live that way for a thousand years? Because within the city, we have, number one, the leaves of the tree. That we're going to eat perfect fruit. Excuse me, not the leaves, the fruit. We're going to have perfect fruit of the trees. And secondly, we're going to have perfect water. We're going to have absolutely pure water, pure, fresh water. No contaminants in any of that. And we're going to be shielded from the harmful rays of the sun. This is what it's going to be like in the New Jerusalem. And that is our home. Listen to Titus chapter 2, verse 13. We're waiting for our blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, Paul says, is our great God. Jesus is our God and Savior. He is God in the flesh. So he's able to provide all of this for us. Listen again to Isaiah chapter 25, uh, verses, well, I, I think just two verses, uh, maybe verse 6. If you, look, if you want to turn to that, Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6. On this mountain, and that would be the mountain of the holy city, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine and rich food full of marrow and aged wine well refined. In verse 8, he will, he will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away tears from all from all faces. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. The word Lord means master. The Lord who saves. So this is God in the flesh, our Lord. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And then verse 9. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him. I just read that, didn't I? All right. Now, uh, he will be known as creator. Today, we believe that Jesus Christ created the heavens and the earth. Um, Verse 5, and he, he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. This is Jesus Christ seated on his throne on this earth. Right now he's seated on the Father's throne in the third heaven. And so from that throne he says, Behold, I am making all things new. Now what is the significance of that? We will not only know him as our God, we will know that he is the creator. We far underestimate the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. Listen to uh, three proof texts. Number one, you'll find in John chapter 1, verse 3. In the beginning was the word, the word was life, and you, you understand that, all right? Verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 3. Now let that sink into your head. All things were made by him. By who? By the Word. And who is the Word? Jesus Christ. He is the Creator. He is the one who spoke the world into existence. He's the one that formed man out of the dust of the earth, and he's the one that breathed life into the nostrils of man. This is Jesus Christ. Um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him, 
all things are and were created. Colossians 1, 16. The, by him, everything was created. And then, number three, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, through whom he created the world. There's three proof texts that Jesus Christ is the creator. This is very important. Our children need to be taught that Jesus Christ is more than our Savior. Now granted, that would be enough. But Jesus is more than that. Jesus is God in the flesh. More than that, Jesus is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is our creator. And he says that he makes all things new. Now let's go back to the Old Testament. Let me uh, ask you to turn to Isaiah uh, chapter 60. The last uh, 10 chapters of Isaiah are very insightful. And everybody needs to be familiar with those last 10 chapters of, uh, of Isaiah, or basically the last six chapters. And we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 60, verse 18 and follow. Now, Ezekiel, uh, I mean, Isaiah has given us a picture of the millennial reign of Christ, conditions on the earth during the thousand year reign. In verse 18, violence shall no more be heard in your land. Devastation or destruction within your borders, you shall call your walls salvation. And that's for walls there. We're going to look at, in the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the walls around the New Jerusalem. And you'll call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Verse 19. The sun shall no more, the sun shall be no more, your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. You know, there are two kinds of light. There is natural light, and there is created light. Do you understand that in the creation of the universe that there was light before the Lord said, let there be light? The darkness covered the earth. It had been lit before, but it became dark. And so there was light in the firmament before the Lord gave the sun and the moon for light. Here, we're going to look at this a little later on in chapter 21. It won't be tonight. But uh, probably next week, we'll be, no, will we be here next week? Is that music count next week? Wednesday night? Okay, I music think we don't have Bible class. Huh? Music count is during the day. Yeah. Your music counts too. Okay, so we'll have Bible class next week. Good. I'd hate to miss a week. But uh, uh, we'll, 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 we'll be looking at the natural light inside the New Jerusalem which is not the sun, it's not the moon, it is Jesus Christ, who himself is the what? Light of the world. Mm -hmm. Verse 19, the sun shall no more be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Verse 20, your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Uh, chapter 61, <coughs> beginning in verse 5. Isaiah 61, verse 5. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners, and this all is referring to unredeemed people, unbelievers. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers, but you shall be called the priest of the Lord. 
They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Verse, uh, chapter 65, verse 1. Just flip to that. Isaiah 65, 1. And I'm skipping a lot of good things here. You need to go back and read these. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Verse 21. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And then verse 25. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. So you've heard all of the other descriptions of this, but this is real. This is what God has prepared for those who love him. Very important. And then in verses 5 and 6 of Revelation 21, we find a divine confirmation. A divine confirmation. Listen to verse 5. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Understand that. These words are trustworthy and true. Now the question is, do you believe them? And that's not a question you need to answer right here. You need to meditate on that. Do you believe them? And a lot of people say, well, that's your interpretation. I challenge you to find any other place to place these scriptures. This is the Word of God. I've not added to the Word of God. I haven't taken anything away from the Word of God. This is it. And the question is, do you believe it? If you believe it, you are really blessed. And you have a purpose in living. This is our hope. I told you that the word hope is the Greek word elpis. And it means a vast uh, it, it means uh, anticipation of something yet to come. Joyful anticipation of something yet to come. All believers rejoice and, and, and rejoice in the hope of everlasting life. Everybody does. But to define it and to tell anybody what it is, very few people can do that. Very few people. Most people would just say, well, it just means living on and on. Living where? Well, living in the third heaven. Well, what's it like? Well, we don't know. Yes, we do. We know what it's like if we'll just listen. Why else would these scriptures be in your Bible? It's for our comfort. It's for our joy. And it's to open up our hope to us. Joyful anticipation for something wonderful yet to come. God is gracious. Listen to verse 6. He said, write these things down for they're true and trustworthy. And I think there's an unfortunate uh, verse division here because I think verse 5 belongs to verse 6. And he said to me, it is done. Write this down because this is the true and trustworthy uh, word. Write this down. It is done. I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. And that's the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. Jesus said, I'm the beginning and I'm the end. And I'm everything in between. The beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spirit, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my sons. Now sons is different than children. Two words, 
for children. One is the word titnon, and that means naturally born children. We are the titnon of God. We are the children of God. But this word son takes us beyond being a child. The word son refers to a mature person, one who's no longer a child, but one who has matured. The application of that word is we have to mature in the faith. God has given us his word to study and to grow in grace. And as we grow, we become mature. We mature through education. That's the way our children mature. The better they're taught, the better they mature. The worse they're taught, the worse they mature. And we look at now a couple of generations of young people who have not been taught very much. And we see that they continue to live like children. We want our children to grow up to maturity. But it's very hard for immature parents to raise a child to maturity. So we want to grow in grace so we can help our children grow in grace. So he says here that we'll be called his sons. That's the word weos in the Greek. And it may, means a mature child who is ready to work in the father's business. That was Jesus, who grew in wisdom and stature and became a worker along beside his father, Joseph, who was a carpenter. And so Jesus was known also as a carpenter. He had matured. He was a son. And so you and I are to grow up to be sons of God, mature individuals who are no longer blown about by every wind of doctrine, and remember James chapter 1, that a man who is, uh, doesn't have the wisdom is like a wave of the sea. He's blown about by every wind of doctrine, and he's unstable in all of his ways. And sadly, that's a characteristic of many of church members. And that's proved by, by the fact that people can just go from one denomination to another. Bible doctrine is what, what created various denominations was our interpretation of the scripture and our understanding of Bible doctrine. And Pentecostals are not Baptists. And Baptists are not Pentecostals. And Baptists are not Methodists. And Methodists are not Baptists. And Lutherans are not Baptists. Neither are Baptist Lutherans. But we live in a generation where it, everyone is just melded together. Everyone, the walls have come down because doctrine is no longer important. The only thing that is important now is telling somebody how they can have a better life, how they can be more successful. And we have scuttled Bible doctrine. What we're looking at here tonight is pure Bible doctrine. And this is what we are called to believe. Now back in chapters 2 and 3, we found seven letters to seven churches and to every one of those churches. The promise was to him who conquers. And in our James study, we looked at what is it we're to conquer. And it is self. It's the old nature, the old man, which is always childish. It wants what it wants now. And it will scream and throw a tantrum until it gets what it wants. And we treat the old nature like a little child. To quiet the old nature, what do we do? We give the old nature what it wants. This is what people are doing with alcohol. It's what people are doing with drugs. It's what some are doing with food. It's what some are doing with, with sensual passions. Those passions rage, and there's a war going on. The flesh is screaming for satisfaction, and we satisfy the flesh. The immature person is like a child spiritually. And so we are called to grow in grace and become mature individuals. We are to conquer. Now here's the promise. If we'll do that, we're going to do well. To him that conquers, this is the one who will enjoy all of these benefits. That's where we're going to be into infinity. Well, praise his name. What a joy. So I told you it was going to be better tonight than some of the nights we've had. It might be a little rougher next week. 
because uh, we still got a passage of scripture to look at that's uh, that, that's a little little disconcerting. But we're going to enjoy looking at that, and I hope you'll be with us next week. And uh, I hope this has been a help to you. And afterwards, if anybody's got a question, I'm not going to entertain questions right here. But afterwards, if you got a question, be sure to ask it. And uh, uh, if I can answer it, I will. And if I if I can't, I'll do my best to uh, to find an answer and give you one later on. All right. Thank you for being here. It's been a joy. Let's pray together. Father, we give you praise and we thank you for the joy and the privilege we have of spending these moments together. They're indeed precious moments. Thank you for the attention that every person has given to uh, this study, and we pray that uh, they've benefited from it. We pray that these are some things that, uh, that will stick to our minds and will become very important to us because we find here a real purpose in living a disciplined Christian life. And we can't answer all the questions, but we certainly can't answer many of them. And we thank you for your revelation. And we ask now, Lord, that you'd be with us as we go on our way. We pray that you'd uh, bless us with good days between now and Sunday. And we look forward to coming back together on Sunday morning with a great, uh, uh, for a great time of worship and praise. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. amen. Well, God bless you until Sunday morning.